Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to my session on security in ASP.NET Core, where I will probably be heckled by Dominic at the back because he knows more about some security things than I do. I will freely admit that. My name is Barry Dorans. I am the .NET Security PM. The slides and the demos for this will be available from my website, which is idono.org. Um, probably in about 20 minutes after I'm done, assuming the hotel Wi-Fi does not fall over, which seems to be quite often here. Um, basically, my job is to try and tell everyone how to do things correctly from a security perspective. I also own certain features of ASP.NET that are related by security. And then when everything goes wrong and someone hacks us, I'm the person that has to deal with it, which is why I chain smoke in order to quickly end my pain. Um, you can follow me on Twitter as Applodart. It is not very work focused, I will warn you now. Um, today, it has been pictures of ibis, weird looking birds that I apparently am told are called bin chickens. <sighs> you people are weird. So, I'm going to cover some of the various things that we've done in ASP.NET Core 2.0. I was going to cover some of the things that are coming up in 2.1, but my 2.1 install does not work. So, we're just going to talk about those vaguely, but unfortunately, I can't demo. First up is hosting. In ASP.NET Core, we decided that we didn't like any web server on the planet that already existed. And so we thought it would be a great idea to write our own, which is wonderful from a performance point of view. From a security point of view, it's very much um, giving me an ulcer, to be perfectly honest. However. We did a lot of work in Kestrel for 2.0, including having some pen testers come in from outside and beat up on it. And when you tell pen testers we have a brand new web server for you to test, they tend to get very, very excited because that doesn't happen very often. Um, Kestrel now supports HTTPS. Um, we have finally updated Visual Studio, so it will issue self-signed certs that Chrome does not barf on. If you have an existing self-signed cert, we won't update it because we don't want to overwrite you. But you can update it yourself manually by following that gist, and you can get a self-signed cert that Chrome is happy with. You can configure the certs via config like this. It's all very exciting because uh, the way that we are now building our web hosts has using a lot of um, opinions and defaults. And we've decided that, yes, this is probably the easiest way to do things. So now you just have like two lines rather than 17 to configure stuff. But you could still have those 17 lines if you are paid by the line of code. We have a lot of limits in Castro. Uh, in version one, we had all of those. I'm not going to go through the slide. In version two, we added some more. Uh, and when we added those, We've come to the conclusion that, yes, you can run Kestrel as your main web server with nothing in front of it. I am very careful in my wording here, which makes Fowler really unhappy. He's like, what are you trying to say? Um, with Kestrel 2.0, using it on the edge will no longer be unsupported, which is a wonderful phrase that should make you stop and think. Basically, if you used it on the edge in one, we're like, hey, you're on your own. It's not our problem. Uh, in 2.0, if you want to do it, feel free. Now, would I recommend it? No. Um, and I think we're all in agreement, except maybe perhaps for David, uh, in that it's a new web server. It's been out for a year. It hasn't been beaten up a lot by attackers. It's been beaten a lot by us. But with the best will in the world, we're probably not going to catch everything. There are going to be some weird edge cases where someone will be able to denial of service attack your server. And IIS was the same, as was Apache in the first three or four years of existing. So I would honestly recommend that you still put a proxy in front, like Nginx or IIS, and then stream everything through to Kestrel. But if you want to live dangerously, feel free. Uh, and we will support you. Authentication. In .NET Core, in one, uh, we rewrote all our authentication story and our authorization story. So there are a few options that you have. You have no authentication, which obviously is still a type of authentication. You're just anonymous. You have individual user accounts where everything is stored in a local database. 
that you have to manage and back up and hope never ever leaks, so you have to secure it. Uh, we have work and school accounts, which is Azure Active Directory. And we have Windows authentication for those of you that are running on internal Windows only networks. You do not switch Windows authentication on to the internet. It's a bad, bad thing. Uh, we have social auth. We have Facebook, Twitter, Google, Microsoft account, and OAuth built in. There is a community-driven project for lots and lots and lots of providers for social networks that I have never heard of. But you can basically find pretty much everything you want uh, in the ASP.NET Security OAuth providers uh, project in ASP.NET Contrib. So template auth, like I say, we have local databases. Uh, everything is done via EF, so you can change how your uh, models look. It's very opinionated in how we store passwords. Uh, we're not going to let you change that because we think we know best. Uh, so it, it is what it is. Um, and eventually, we will be supporting authentication via OIDC. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Work and school accounts, Azure Active Directory. It's OpenID Connect based. Uh, if you have ADFS in your network and you want to use ADFS, you must upgrade to ADFS 2016 which if you're not the network administrator, good luck in convincing them to do that because network administrators do not like changing major parts of their network, but it is necessary. Um, we have had lots of requests for SAML and WS Fed because a bunch of you work with governments and banks and people that generally don't move at a fast rate. It's not there yet. It will be there sometime between now and 2.1. You won't have to wait for 2.1. We're probably planning to push it out in about a month. Uh, the support that we needed for it got delivered two weeks before 2.0 dropped. So we're like, yeah, OK, we're not going to do that right now. Uh, so check again in about a month. And we should have WS Fed support for all those banks and governments. And Windows authentication obviously needs to be running on Windows. So it requires IIS. And it's just against local domain join servers. We don't do impersonation by default anymore, which is something that we used to do in the .NET framework. So you could say if someone is logging in via integrated auth, I can now pretend to be them. It causes some rather interesting scalability problems. So if you are going to need impersonation, you will have to manually impersonate just around the little bits that you need to, like database access, for example. So we threw away custom identity classes. You can no longer uh, really use a custom identity or custom principle. Everything is claims principle based. We can have multiple authentication. Uh, it was middleware in one. It's now just providers in two. Uh, they don't have to run automatically. Basically, you could allow your users to log in with cookies, but then have an API that needs a JWT token, and it will magically work, as long as you remember what the right spell to make it magically work is. Um, only one middleware will run with every request. So there is one middleware that will always look at a request coming in and try and construct an identity out of it if you will have to choose which one that is. Normally, it's cookies. And if you are using cookie authentication, we finally got to the point of understanding the difference between you being unauthenticated or you being authenticated but not allowed to do what you want to do. So 401 versus 403 because we sucked at that in the .NET framework, and we fixed it. In two, well, OK, so the, the support for multiple middlewares was a great idea, um, but we kind of budged it. It was far too easy to configure more than one default middleware, and then you put yourselves in what we politely call an unsupported experience, which basically means we have no idea what's going to happen, and <laughs> you're on your own. Uh, so we fix this. Authentication in two is a single service. And then you plug the authentication pieces into that service. So it's like a little DI container all of its own. Um, so we fixed the active versus passive stuff and the selection of multiple middleware. So now you can't send yourself into a spin. And finally, I got rid of two-factor auth via SMS or email. If you go file new project in ASP.NET 2.0, you will see that we support authenticator apps, which is nice because NIST has been saying for a long time, don't use SMS for your two-factor auth because it's incredibly easy to social engineer your way through 
the very lax security on American mobile networks and steal someone's phone number. So I can, I can vaguely demo this. It's not very exciting. Here is our template. And if I can find the right project, there we go. Set a startup project. We'll run it. And it's going to do everything that you expect it to do, except by default, it doesn't generate a QR code for legal reasons, kind of legal reasons. If we use third-party um, software, we have to put it through a bunch of code scans, and we also have to make sure that it's supported if it's an active um, open source project. And I haven't found one yet that meets all our criteria for QR codes. So if I log in, so we're not allowed to ship it. I am, however, allowed to document it and say, this is how you can do it. So that's what I've ended up doing. When you use the templates, you will see that uh, when you run things, there is a little line of code uh, that says, go to this, this documentation website, and it will tell you how to generate QR codes. And I have done this in this template. So when this eventually wakes up, yay, I can go here. We've made account manage a little bit prettier. I can then choose to configure an authenticator app with a QR code. Yay! People have been wanting this for ages. And it's been um, sort of sitting there in uh, ASP.NET Core 1.1. It's just we never wired it up because we hadn't tested it properly. <laughs> so you can get your uh, authenticator apps, and that should hopefully make everybody happy. Many of you have been using .NET Core 1.0. Not enough of you. I, I dislike you all immensely. OK, fair enough. So if you are porting things from 1.0 to 2.0, um, how many of you have tried this? How many of you tried it with the release candidates? Yeah. How many of you have then tried your port from the release candidates to RTM? Two one of which is Dominic, who writes Identity Server, so he does not count. So um, it's a little bit painful. It's even more painful if you move to RC2, because we changed things for RTM. So I apologize to that other one person. Uh, this was how you configured things in 1.0. Uh, you had used cookie authentication. And then this is how we changed things in 2.0. You have app.use authentication in your configure method, and then you add authentication in your services, and then you chain off all the authentication handlers that you want. You will note that our way of fixing you, uh, or of stopping you messing up having multiple handlers is now the options for authentication middleware or handlers is set at the authentication level rather than the individual handler level. So there are a bunch of defaults. If you're using one, you can just use default scheme. If you're using multiple ones, well, you have a choice. If you start using social auth, which is what Fowler likes to do in all his demos, uh, we now make him do a little bit of extra work because you have to configure the default authenticate handler, which is the one that runs on every request and constructs an identity. Default signing handler, which is what gets called when someone calls sign in. And default challenge, which is what gets called when someone hits challenge, for example, by encountering an endpoint that has an authorized attribute on it. So if you were using Twitter, because it's Fowler's example and I like to be helpful, <coughs> yeah. uh, you would set the authenticate handler to be cookies, because you want to use cookies to persist your identity. You have sign in being cookies, because you want to have your identity persisted. But challenge would go to Twitter, because that's what you want to actually perform the little login dance. We moved where authenticate challenge and sign in was from context.authentication just up to context. So uh, you need to search your code for context.authentication and just remove authentication. You will get warnings uh, about deprecation. If you tried this in RC2, we had the warnings on some things and not in others because we suck and we like to make life difficult for you. But the warnings are now finally there in the RTM code. So one of the questions we get asked, or one of the scenarios we get asked a lot, um, is cookie authentication without ASP.NET identity. ASP.NET identity is the bits and pieces that 
keep your username and password and roles and claims in a local database. But people don't necessarily want to use that because it's a bit of overhead. And my god, it's really hard to understand sometimes. So people want to use the cookie middleware on their own because rolling your own encryption scheme for identity cookies is a really bad idea. So I'm going to walk you through how we do this just because it is such a common scenario. Um, so everything is going to end up in your cookie middleware, your cookie handler, and we will encrypt and sign cookies for you when you call sign in. And by default, that uses our data protection layer, which I'll talk about later. But we have a keychain that you need to synchronize between multiple servers. If you are going to run with multiple servers, which a lot of people are, you can just shove them in a database. You can shove them in Redis. You can shove them in a shared folder. You can shove them in Azure Key Vault. You can write your own. It is incredibly easy. And then the cookies will take the identity on every request and rehydrate it. So in order to do this, you have to sign in and sign out, calling HTTP contacts.sign in and HTTP contacts.sign out. You just give it a principle, and it will write the cookie. It's magical. But when you drop a cookie, it's the sole source of truth. We don't go back to your database. We don't check things for you as long as that cookie exists. We're going to take the identity from it until you implement a validator, which ASP.NET Identity does for you. So if you think about it, you're probably going to want to do this every time there's a request or every certain number of requests. You want to check if a user is still valid, if you haven't you know, banned them for posting uh, poop emojis on your message board. So you need to hook in a validator. And a validator can either reject a principle or it can actually update it, which is handy if you are changing the roles or the claims that are associated with the user. You can even go further. ASP.NET Identity uses it to support sign out everywhere. So if you have someone uh, who has logged in from multiple browsers or from a phone, from multiple machines, we use the validator to sign out every single one at once. And it runs on every single request. It's up to you to throttle it. It's up to you to throttle it going back to your database, which you will want to do. ASP.NET Identity runs it about every 15 minutes. Uh, you can customize that in ASP.NET Identity. So this is what a validator looks like. It's nice and simple. It, it is ooh, a static class, which means there is no DI. Uh, you're going to have to manually do that yourself, I'm afraid. Eventually, it will turn into a service, but we had so many other things to do that we did not get around to it. So that's how you wire it up. And let's just go through our very exciting demo. Cookie off from scratch. Here we go. Set a startup. So we have an account controller that is going to log you in. And this is pretty much the standard account controller. I'm just going to construct a principle here. And then I call sign in async. I give it a scheme name, which is just a string that is going to identify your handler. So you can have multiple instances of cookie handlers, for example. But you need to tell us which one you're going to sign into. You pass in the principle. You tweak how the cookie is going to live somewhat. And then you do a, a redirect to local. We're wiring it up in startup. So we have use authentication and configure. And then in configure services, we're going to add authentication. We're going to tell it that we want to use our cookie middleware that we're about to add. And we're just going to use the default scheme. And then we add our cookie underneath. And you can see here that we are validating a, or we are wiring up a validator just to prove that validators work. So I have a simple validator that if I hit refresh enough times, it will update my principle. So it's just going to pretend as if I was in a group, and I'm going to update groups. So if I run this, it will eventually start. I blame your Australian internet. So I have logged in once. So I have a count of once. And then if I hit refresh, one, two, three, I hit five. Uh, the validator is going to kick in and update me every five requests. And you will see that number keeping going up and up and up. So I could just log myself out. 
I could have updated my name. I could have changed the roles that I'm in or the claims that are associated with my, my claims principle. So if you are doing cookie middleware, or middleware, it's not middleware anymore, it's handlers. If you are doing cookie authentication with our handlers by default, wire up a validator so you can keep the identity up to date with whatever your backend thinks is there. So like I said, we can have multiple handlers. So we could have cookie in one point. Uh, we could have jot somewhere else. And you would, can tell the authorized attribute which handler you want to use by specifying the scheme name, that string that says, this is the identity of a handler that you have wired up. So what used to happen was that people would wire up jot and people would wire up cookies. And then your API would accept both, whereas I'm sure we all realize that APIs should not be accepting cookies anymore because there's a bunch of CSRF vulnerabilities that you really don't want to deal with. So you can limit the identity that is accepted by specifying the scheme name. So this was where I was going to demo my 2.1 stuff. Uh, but I've been talking to the dev, and we spent the last three days trying to get the damn thing to work. And it does not, because it requires uh, ASP.NET Core 2.1. And I've tried to install that, and it destroyed my machine. And I had to pull it out again, and then it just got very messy. So I'm going to have to talk about this in theory. I am sorry there are no demos. Um, we've the, the cookie auth flow has, has been, well, it's been our opinion of how things should happen. But identity has a bunch of standards around it. And one of these is OpenID Connect. So we have been thinking, and we will probably deliver a slim, opinionated OpenID Connect service in ASP.NET identity. So the flow will look slightly different. The URLs that you will have will look like standard OIDC URLs. And we'll be logging in with OIDC before we use cookies to drop an identity. So this is kind of nice because it's decoupling your app code from your authentication code. So it can just be like hidden away in a NuGet package. And it allows you to support external clients, first party clients, third party clients. You can write your own uh, mobile app and use the OIDC pieces to log in. Um, and if you get to the point of being sick of managing your own databases, we hope to get to the point of having a button that will take your local creds, your local identity store, and just shove it into Azure B2C so you never have to worry about it again. If you don't like Azure B2C, there are other options because it's using OIDC, so it's nice and standard. Um, we're only going to support authorization and hybrid code flows and implicit for SPA applications so you're no longer using cookies for SPAs. If you want to use more than we give you, and a lot of you will, then Dominic is sitting at the back row there with Identity Server, and that's where I recommend you go. He supports an awful lot more of the OIDC standard than we do. Like I say, we are giving you a skinny, opinionated one that only supports two or three common scenarios. Identity server is the big main OIDC server for .NET. So if you want more than we give you, you can plug in identity server. And because we're going to use OIDC, it is a matter of commenting out, use ASP.NET identity service, or whatever we're going to call it, and replace that call with app.use identity server. And that's it. That's why we want to move to OIDC, so you can swap with one line of code. And it worked in RC2, and then we yanked it out because we didn't think it was ready, and it doesn't work anymore, so I can't demo it. It was impressive when it worked, I promise you. It looked really good in Oslo. So you have your options of Identity Server, ASOS, and OpenIDict, which are the, the three uh, .NET third-party ones. Or you can use Azure B2C. Authorization. For those of you that have not used ASP.NET Core, this is where we changed everything. How many of you have written your own custom authorized attribute? OK, keep your hands up. Now, uh, drop your hands if you thought this was easy and didn't suck. Really? I had three people drop their hands. Wow, OK. Yeah, OK, we know this sucked. Um, and it sucked hard. So. We decided to redo everything in .NET Core. 
which upsets some people because we can't make everyone happy all of the time, but most people have been happy with what we've done. You do not need to write your own authorization attribute anymore. In fact, if you do, it won't do anything. The authorization attribute in .NET Core is just a marker. And what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to remove hard-coded rules or hard-coded rules and attributes, things like usernames, claims, groups, whatever else. We have moved all authorization into code. Everything is based in a policy and requirements and requirements handlers. So your policy says the current user has to fulfill one or more requirements. And then each requirement may have one or more handlers that will tell the policy that the current user has fulfilled those requirements. And we've also added resource-based authorization because Dominic had been on us for absolutely ages to do it, and it fell nicely into this. It's all put in DI like most of ASP.NET Core is these days, and you still have your scheme filtering. Um, and you can even replace the entire thing if you don't like our implementation and have your own policy provider. There is a workshop which is there. Um, the the 2.0 stuff was for 2.0 RC2, and I have not gotten around to updating it because Aussie internet sucks, and I can't even uh, sync my repo. I've been trying for three days. It's just not a pleasant experience. So when I get back next week, it will be updated for 2.0 RTM. If you're one of the two people that logged a bunch of issues this week saying it was broken, um, if you are in the room, I'm sorry. I will get around to it when I get back and I have internet again. So let's talk about what requirements are. Um, if you have ever been to Microsoft in Redmond, uh, and I assume it is exactly the same for the various offices here, you will see people using their badges to scan into a door. So having a badge is a requirement for opening a door at Microsoft. So we can express this as, gee, an office entry requirement. And all it does is you implement I authorization requirement, which has nothing on it. It's a marker interface. And then we have our requirements. So we have to figure out a way to handle them, a way to process them. So we have one or more authorization handlers against each of our requirements. So here, this does actually have something on the interface, handle requirement async. I'm going to look at the user. I'm going to make sure that he has a valid badge number. I'm going to make sure that it's issued by me. And if it is, everything's good. If it isn't, I'm just going to return. So you call context.succeed on the requirement if everything is good. If everything is bad, you do absolutely nothing at all because you may have multiple handlers. So the normal way of handling entry is to tap your badge. But if you are like me, about once a month, you forget your badge because you're in a rush. And you have to get this little sticky badge of shame that uh, gets printed out from a thermal printer, and you can't see the, the picture. And then reception has to open the door for you. So that is another way of fulfilling our requirement. I have a temporary badge that hasn't expired, and there's a receptionist there to press the button. So we have one requirement, but two ways to fulfill it, which are two different handlers. And the reason I recommend two different handlers rather than just having one great big handler that checks absolutely everything and branching is, well, that stuff's hard to maintain. But you can reuse handlers over multiple requirements. So you could have, for example, if you were rewriting SharePoint, and someone really ought to, um, you could have, do I have permissions to put a document in this library? Normal user would have permissions, and you would check just by looking up what the user is. But if you're an admin, you may have rights everywhere. So you could have an is admin handler for, every, for everything. And it would run across all your requirements. So rather than doing things in a branch and duplicating all that code, you just keep things in little individual requirements and apply them using policy, and away we go. And then how we express this is when we're adding authorization, we add a policy, and we're going to call this policy building entry. And then we build up all our requirements. And then the one thing that I always forget to do when I am writing demos, and I'm sitting there on stage going, uh, why doesn't this work, is you need to register the handler for the requirement in the DI system. Because I'm lazy, and because badge handler has no state, I can add it as a singleton. But you can add it uh, using the various scopes if you want to do things like inject your database into your handler. That's absolutely fine. Just never do it as a singleton, because that will be a nightmare. <coughs> 
And then you specify the policy on the authorized attribute by, giving, by specifying its name. And away we go. This makes more sense with a demo, like most things. So this is the, this is the actual really technical demo that we have, the, the sole one. So I'm going to set this as a startup project, and I'm going to run it. And we'll see what it looks like on a big screen. You will see how beautiful my UI skills are. So I have noticed whilst I have been walking about that you guys think this is cold. Despite it being 20 degrees, I was wandering around in shorts this morning at 6 AM. And everything was looking at me like I was mad. So here we have my um, emulation of Australian weather and travel. As you can see, it is winter. I'm using a snowman because Aussie winter would probably just be a beach. Uh, so we'll, we'll make this perfectly clear. And we have two options. We can go outside and we can go inside. And we're going to evaluate whether someone is allowed to do that based upon who they are. So if I go outside, it's going to ask me to log in. So I picked famous people. We have Daniel Radcliffe, because he's British. We have Rupert Grint, because he's ginger. And we'll come on to that in a minute. And then we have Steve Irwin. I'm not going to say anything bad about Steve Irwin. So we'll go back, and we will remind you that I am, I am in Australia. And it is winter, and I want to go outside. So I can go outside because I am Daniel Radcliffe. And it's OK if you're British going outside in Australian winter, because it's not cold. What is wrong with you people? OK? And of course, I can go inside, because there's no problems with going inside. Uh, just a quick reminder to check for spiders in the dunny, because dunny just makes me laugh as a word. So I'm going to sign out. I am no longer Daniel Radcliffe. It is winter. I am going to go outside. I'm going to be Steve Irwin. Oh my god, no, it's too cold. You can't go outside because it's only 20 degrees. Now, if I go back and change it so it's summer, Steve Irwin can go outside because apparently it's an acceptable temperature and he won't freeze. If I sign out and I try and go outside again in summer, but I'm Daniel Radcliffe. No, it's too damn warm. 40 degrees is not an acceptable temperature. What are you thinking living here? OK, so we are adjusting. Our policy is evaluating who someone is, what their nationality is, and what the current weather is. And just to be mean to gingers, because that's who I am. Rupert Grint obviously can't go outside in summer in Australia because he's ginger and he will spontaneously combust. If I go back and change the weather to winter, it's 20 degrees. He still can't go outside because it's too darn stunny and he will spontaneously combust. So for Rupert Grint, it doesn't make any difference. He cannot go outside in Australia. So we're going to look at the code now. I can't do these sorts of demos in, in America because they just don't understand the ginger thing. They think gingers are real people. <laughs> I should look around and see if there are ginger people in the audience. That would probably would have been a really clever thing to do. All right, so <laughs> I'm not looking up because there probably is one and they're glaring at me right now and they're trying to steal my soul. So <laughs> is there anyone ginger in the audience that wants to raise? Yeah. <laughs> you, sir, are ginger and bald, so you're fine. <laughs> so. I have a weather provider, the equivalent of, of some sort of database. And so I am injecting that into my DI container. And we will be using that in our policies. I am setting up a policy of inside. And I'm setting up a policy of outside. So what I have done with my requirement is I am making it a parameterized requirement. Remember, requirements have no code. But I can stick properties on them all I like. So I'm going to use the same requirement. I'm going to have a location so I can just branch based upon it. And then we have a handler. And it's going to take our weather provider in so I know what the current weather is. 
and then I'm going to look for the nationality of a user because I'm recycling a demo from Europe and I did stuff with passport control and Brexit and then just made myself very, very sad because I changed it to before and after Brexit and Theresa May got rejected from Europe. Just like she should have been rejected in the polls. However, I can laugh at that, but I'm now stuck with Donald Trump as a president and that's just even worse. I got, I got stopped by um, one of the charity muggers yesterday when I was walking around in my shorts. And he was like, how much do you like nature? And I'm like, I don't even live here. And he goes, how much do you hate Donald Trump? And I'm like, wow, my accent has changed, so I sound American to Australians. So that's really depressing. So I'm going to get the country out of someone's identity, um, which I've shoved in via the account controller. I'm going to log someone in. We're putting their name in. We're giving them a hair color so we can detect Rupert Grint. And we're giving them a country. So if it's outside and the season is summer, that's come from our DI and you're British, it's, fine, or it's, it's not good, so I'm not going to do anything. But if it is good, if I'm Australian and it's not winter, or if I'm British and it's not summer, I'm going to succeed my requirement. And if I'm going inside, I'm always going to succeed my requirement. Now, I could expand this out. So you know, Australian people could go outside in winter if you're all wearing five layers and hats and scarves and at 20 degrees, there are fire pits lit and fire lamps in the outside of the pub, as I saw in Melbourne at the weekend and laughed very hard at. So does this make sense as a requirement and how to fulfill it? This is the sort of thing that you would have had to shove behind your custom attribute before, which was incredibly hard to test. Policies and requirements are incredibly easy to unit test. This does not help Rupert Grint, however. So I've got another requirement. I have, or I've got another requirements handler. So I've got a single requirement, but I have two handlers. And this handler is especially for gingers. And it's going to check that I have a hair claim that has come from the passport control. And if you are ginger and you are trying to go outside, and I don't care what season it is, I am going to fail. I haven't covered failure yet. So there are three things that you can do in a handler. You can succeed. This current user fulfills all the requirements. You can do nothing that says they haven't fulfilled this requirement, but another handler may kick in. And you may fail. And fail is there for those scenarios where even if other handlers have succeeded, fail overrides everything. It's the sort of thing where you use where your database is on fire, or someone has been sacked, but <laughs> The, the systems have not updated yet, and you have a specific check for sacking. Or they're ginger, and they're going to spontaneously combust because they're in Australia. So we have two handlers for a single requirement. And in startup.cs, I remember to put these handlers into DI because I'm not doing this live, because this is where I always forget, and because they're taking uh, requirements that are pretending to be a database, I'm going to add them as transient. And then on my location, inside is going to, in the code, say that I am authorized. I'm going to use my policy for inside. And if outside is going to use my outside policy. What I would recommend is that you never use strings. You end up having a static class uh, that then, where is my static class? Let's go find it. Uh, go to definition. Yeah, so you just have a static class that then exposes your policy names as consts, so you can change them at whim. So does that make sense? Is that easier than writing a custom authorized attribute? Is no one going to admit to that? Cleaner by default. Cleaner by default, yes. It's a little bit less flexible. Um, the complaints that we have heard, a complaint is a strong word, the feedback that we have gotten is that people who have written custom attributes generally have put custom properties on them. And we don't really have support for that. Properties are part of your requirement. So we're going to revisit this in 2.1 and see if we have a nicer way of giving you the ability to write custom attributes that still don't have code, but you can put your own strongly typed properties on there. So you can start building rules up or requirements within your custom attribute. 
There is an issue on the security repo about this. If you have strong feelings about it, I would advise that you go check that out and leave us your comments. But no complaining about the fact that I'm just picking on gingers. So here's a quick summary of where we were with policies, requirements, and handlers. There's no point in me going through that again. And here is what the handler should return. Generally, you just want to call succeed or do nothing at all because of multiple handlers for a requirement. And because it's a service, you can check all of this in code. You could, in your um, controller or your Razor page, because everything is cool and trendy with Razor pages if you listened to Damien yesterday or the day before, <coughs> you can inject the authorization service into your code. And then you can call authorize async. And you don't have to duplicate that stuff that you had in your custom attribute somewhere else. If you failed, you can return forbidden result if you want to tell someone that they're not allowed to get in, or you can return challenge result and it will flow through the login flow again, and then hopefully they can log in with, um, with uh, a, an identity that has access. Just remember to register your handlers. And one thing I will say is I've seen people write a bunch of stuff um, and they're like, oh, well, no one's ever going to send me an identity from someone else. Really? OK. Um, especially with OIDC. It's great. You should be, everything should really be claims based now rather than doing something like checking roles or checking someone's username. So when you're checking claims, check the issuer for the claim to make sure it has come from where you expect. And then we have resource-based authorization, which is just a little step further. Um, taking the SharePoint example, uh, there's a document in a library, and you want to check permissions, whether a user is able to edit that document or delete it. That's not just a requirement on can you access the library, but it depends on the resource that someone is trying to access. So we have the same thing again with policies and requirements and DI and our, on our little system that you can pass a resource through to the authorization service and you can pass an operation through or a requirement through that says this person is trying to do X on resource Y. And then you can pick apart the properties from resource Y. And in our SharePoint example, you'd look at the document author property and see whether the document author is equal to the current user or not and let them do it. Or you'd have another handler that says, are they an admin? Well, then they can do what they want. So you just extend this out. Instead of having an authorization handler that takes in a requirement, you now take in the requirement and the resource that you want to check. It's just an extra parameter. So if you've already gotten into writing policies, you should be able to write resource authorization handlers. If you want to authorize absolutely everywhere, that's how you do it. You just build a policy, and you register it as a filter. Because at the end of the day, policies and attributes end up as filters. And you can limit by scheme in policy. So if you have an API, rather than putting the scheme name in the attribute, because everyone will forget, you can actually enforce it in a policy itself. And because we have things as a service, you can actually inject them into Razor. Or if you're put, this doesn't really um, apply to Razor pages. You would just inject them into your page and, and branch based upon it. So if you are a horrible person, because people get really upset when I say you can do this. You can, in your Razor page, inject the authorization service, call authorize async, and then vary your UI based upon that. Some people don't think that's clean. They would rather put what's going to be shown or not shown in the UI in the view model. But if you're lazy or you're writing demos for presentations, you can inject the authorization service into your view. The only thing that I would remind you to do because our interns do it every single year, is it's all very well hiding things in the UI, but even in your controller, just do the checks again. So for example, we give our interns every summer uh, a blog system to write. It's like, here you go. You know what a blog system is. Why don't you go away and write one and make sure that you have authorization and authentication? And so they will end up adjusting the view. So if you're not logged in, you don't see edit. And then I go, OK, what happens if I type edit in the URL? And they're like, oh, because they haven't duplicated the check in the controller. 
So just remember that hiding things in a UI is not enough. And if you hit all of that, you can replace it because everything's a service. So you can write your own policy resolver. You can write your own policy provider. And you, for now, until we fix this custom parameter problem, you could do parameters as, as sort of like stringify the, the policy name. It's incredibly ugly. But you could just separate stuff with dashes and split it up and get parameters that way. Data protection. How many of you have had to synchronize your machine key across multiple machines to make everything work? For those of you that have done that, how many of you have then changed your machine key after deployment? Not a single hand goes up. How many of you tried it? And then, yeah, OK. And it was bad, wasn't it? It was like, I have to deploy this exactly the same time to every single machine or everything falls apart. I am sorry. Machine key was a bad idea. Um, so it's not there anymore. <coughs> we have replaced machine key with data protection, which is a little bit more complicated, but does allow you to change keys without having to, without having to republish to every single machine. Uh, data protection is aimed at ephemeral data. It's stuff that you can throw away. You don't particularly care. We use it for um, our authentication cookies. We use it for a bunch of typed providers that go into Razor, the temp data provider, and stuff like that. Stuff that you can recreate now. People have been using Machine Key to protect data of their own. So despite all of us saying, no, this is only for ephemeral data, we know that you're going to use it for non-ephemeral data because no one ever wants to write their own crypto code. So it'll work. You just have to be very careful about where your keys are stored in the, and that you don't lose them. So we have taken away the ability to shoot yourself in the foot. Machine key was incredibly bad at that. You could encrypt things but not sign them. If you were at my presentation two days ago, you will know why that is a bad idea. Um, it will provide isolation automatically. It will provide isolation on purposes automatically. And it will try and figure out where your keys should be stored based on your platform. Um, and you can even write your own custom algorithms that, that are going to be used for encryption. This is not for you. This is for Russians. Because, no, seriously, Russia says that you must use our Russian encryption algorithm if you are storing data in Russia. China has been mulling over the same thing. Um, I've seen how your government talks about the internet. So at some point, you may end up doing this yourself as well, because apparently the laws of mathematics do not count when it comes to encryption and storing data. And the Australian government would like you to break the laws of mathematics so they can spy on people's IMs in Facebook. <sighs> but you can do it, just don't. So uh, when I say that we are going to make all your choices for you, security people tend to get very upset. These are the minimum ones. We don't allow you to go any lower than this. And you can send this to your security people and go, here, they are using good defaults. So what we have is a key ring. And each key ring has a single master key in it to start off with. And every 90 days, a new master key will be inserted into the key ring. And everything will roll over slowly by default. So we create a new master key probably about three or four days before the 90-day period is up to make sure that it syncs. And then everybody sort of flips over around the 90-day period, because the data that we encrypt has a key identifier at the start and says, I'm going to use this key. And then when uh, system number one starts using the new key, system number two knows it's using the new key, so it can go and check for it. Uh, we derive keys based on purpose in every single payload. So if you encrypt the same data with data protection twice, the result will not be the same, because that stops people trying to figure out parts of what your data is. So we're going to use AES256 uh, CBC and H HMAC SHA-256. We give you some key stores. If you're running Azure Web Apps, it's all done magically for you. The key store will flow between all your instances until you use slots, because Azure Key Vault have not given us storage between slots. And lots of people use slots to swap stuff over. And then we're back into the same problem we have with machine key, where everything is out of sync. So if you use slots, this is not what you want to do. If you are running I, and we'll come on to what you do want to do in a minute. 
If you're using IIS with no user profile, we shove things in the registry. If you're using IIS with a profile, which is what you're doing in Visual Studio, uh, we store it in app data. And then on Linux, because Linux has no good security story by default, we store the keys in memory and throw them away afterwards, which is why we say this is targeted at ephemeral data. If you want to use it on your own data, you need to make some changes to the defaults. We will protect your keys as well. If you're on Windows, we use DPAPI. If you're on Windows in an Active Directory, we'll use DPAPI NG, which just means that everything flows nicely. Uh, you can use Next 509 certificate, or you can just not protect it at all, which is probably not a good idea for your encryption keys. You can do it manually. Lots of people do. You create an iData protection provider. You create a, a data protector with a purpose from it. And then you call protect and unprotect with your data. And that's it. So here is how you would do it. We are using the ephemeral data protector, just to remind you that things get thrown away. We have purposes. And purposes are allowed to provide isolation. So the key, uh, the, the, the purpose might be slightly different. For example, you want to encrypt someone's uh, credit card number. Not that you would ever store a full credit card number, because then the banks get really upset. But we'll take this as an example. You would store your credit card number using one purpose, and you would store perhaps someone's address using another purpose. So the same key can't be used to decrypt both. Uh, don't use user input for this. It's an incredibly silly idea. It means that uh, an attacker would be able to construct uh, a derived key uh, that might not be the one that you want. So we have uh, configuration points, the key stores, the encryption algorithms. You can sort of like up, up if you're in Russia. And you can change the key expiration policy. So if you don't like 90 days, you can lower it to 30. Please don't set it to 1. Um, we set it to 1 just to prove that the key rolling works, which was quite fun. Um, but that's just a bit too much work for your per application. Uh, and there is a forward compatibility package for uh, .NET 5.2. So the reason we have a forward uh, a forward compatibility package is people want to be able to log into their .NET Framework app, their MVC 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 app, and share the authentication cookie with a core app. Now, we're not going to reinvent machine key and core. That's what we used to use on Framework. So we took data protection, and we put it into the .NET Framework. So you have to pull your .NET Framework app up to make it work with .NET Core, rather than crippling .NET Core and sucking it down into a vortex of depression. So configuring services, nice and easy. Everything's a service. We will add data protection. Then we will choose where we are going to store our keys. And then we are going to choose how we protect our keys. And then finally, we set an application name, because then we have isolation between apps. If you want to, sh if you want to share data protected data, between applications, then you need to set a static application name that is the same for all your applications. If you want to write your own IXML repository, we used XML because it gave us some nice encryption capabilities. And there are only two things you need to do. You need to uh, give it a way to get every single key, and you need to give it a way to store a single key. So it is honestly easy to write your own one of these. In 2.0, we now allow you to protect your keys with an X509 certificate everywhere. We only did that in the desktop before because encrypted XML was not in core. And we have Key Vault if you are running in Azure. And it will use certificates stored in Key Vault to protect your data. Now, you still need a backing store because, like I said, this is the protection provider. So it layers on top of where you are storing your keys. But we have, we have ones that are suitable. We have blob storage. We have Redis. Then we have local file system. Um, someone wrote one for MySQL. I've seen one for SQLite. And it's only, two, uh, it's only two things that you need to implement, so it is easy to do. So back compat. We have our yank ASP.NET up package for cookie sharing. Um, the docs are a little bit weird. So I have my current version of, of how to do this sitting on that GitHub repo. And we just did some general stuff. The HTML encoder, um, all our encoders are based on safe lists rather than exclusion lists, because generally that's a better idea. Um, 
the HTML encoder is quite opinionated in what it will encode and, and not encode by default. We will encode basic English, or sorry, we will leave basic English alone, but as soon as you start wandering off uh, the basic Unicode plan, if you are going to go to Chinese plans or Russian plans or Japanese or ancient hieroglyphs, of which there is a code point for in Unicode, they will all get encoded by default in your HTML. And then people go, well, my HTML is very big. And I say that you can uh, configure the HTML encoder. So if you know that you're going to use those characters and you consider those characters safe, you can turn off encoding for each uh, code table in each of the Unicode stuff. Now, people go, well, of course they're safe. If anything, um, it's, it's the basic English ones that are unsafe. And that's probably true. Uh, the reason why we're being paranoid is that browser security sucks especially IE, uh, and that we have seen too many bugs in the handling of Unicode code points in browsers. So we're going to be very safe and very paranoid by default. And if you want to take the risk, you can just turn off the encoding. We have CSRF, uh, cross-site request forgery. You can actually turn the checks on automatically now. Uh, we have a way of accessing it in Razor for use in JavaScript, so you don't need to do all sorts of ugliness. If you're using Razor pages, Razor pages will both insert and check the CSRF token for you. We can't do that in straightforward MVC because it would break too many people, and I don't want the complaints. Um, we have Core's middleware, and the one that spent four weeks of arguing with Mr. Fowler about uh, was the default for environment. How many of you have deployed an old application up and forgotten to turn debug off and had a yellow screen of death with your stack traces when a user hits an error. The rest of you are lying. So by default now, in all ASP.NET Core applications, the default environment is release. You have to jump through hoops or run your code from within Visual Studio to set the development environment to development. And all our templates use uh, environment checks. If is development, then we're going to put in the full stack trace error. So when you shove them up to a live server, because the default is released, none of that code runs. So we're being safer by default. This is how you enable automatic CSRF validation. This is how you get the CSRF tokens and views. And finally, we have secrets. Um, far too many people check in their encryption keys or their machine key in web.config on GitHub, including certain people at Microsoft who have done it in sample code. So we have uh, the concept of secrets. If, if you're looking at um, settings in ASP.NET Core, a lot of things will come out of your settings.json file. But if you go to Azure, for example, and set things for your application, those get shoved in environment variables. So your secrets can end up in environment variables, and that's absolutely fine, because you can't check them into GitHub. Uh, but what do you do during development? You don't want to mess around with environment variables. So we have a secrets manager that puts a secrets file in your user profile way, way out of where your source code lies. So you would have to copy it and do all sorts of really, really dumb things in order to put it in your repository. Uh, we have support for Azure Key Vault for putting your secrets if you don't like environment variables. But of course, that's not on Linux. So you're stuck with environment variables there. So that's pretty much it. It is a quick run through uh, what we've done, which will hopefully make most of you happy. Um, for those of you that do want custom properties on uh, custom authorization attributes, please go to the ASP.NET security repo on GitHub and give us your requirements. It is the top issue right now. Um, we will listen, and we will try to make you happy. So I have, who just tweeted about my presentation? I have, gee, one minute which is great, because it means Dominic can't ask a question or make a comment and embarrass me. Does anyone other than Dominic have a question? Everyone's staring at Dominic now. Hello, the person next to Did Dominic tell you something to ask? What was the, the question is, what was the solution with slots and data protection? You would end up using blob storage or Azure Key Vault to store your data protection key ring in. 
rather than letting Azure do its thing and storing it in a secret place on the, well, it's not exactly secret, you can find it quite easily by looking at the code, but as a, as a directory in the file system. So if you're using slots, use Azure blob storage. Now remember when we put things in blob storage, it's not encrypted by default, so you still either need to use an X509 certificate, which gets deployed across all your slots because they'll do that for you, um, or Key Vault to hold an X509 certificate to protect the stuff that is in blob storage. Does anyone else have a question, or are we all just wanting our like sweets and sticky buns as we run to the next session? No? Great. Oh, here's an easy one. When do I expect 2.1? I refuse to answer that because I am not Damien. Um, we do not publicly comment on when we will release stuff, mainly because Fowler does something unhappy. And then I have to go, no, we can't do that. And it gets delayed a week or two. Um, I honestly don't know. We've started writing it now. If you look at the daily bill server, you will see that there are daily bills for 2.1. But I have no idea when it will come out. That is not my decision to make. Damien gets paid far more than me to make that sort of decision. And I'm not about to undercut him or second guess him. Nice try, though. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope this has been useful. The code and the slides will be available in about 20 minutes off my website. Thank you.